The story begins like this. Imam Malik was about nine or ten years old. He was a cheeky little boy when he was a child. And he didn't listen to his parents much. They had a bit of a hard time with him. He had pigeons and used to herd pigeons. That's what he used to do as a child. When he was sitting at the dinner table, his father tested his children with a fiqh question, understanding of the laws. Malik didn't know the answer, but his older brother knew the answer quickly. His father said to Malik, the pigeons distracted you from knowing knowledge. And this struck Imam Malik right in the heart as a child, it angered him. It angered him to make a decision, not to fight with his brother or to get jealous. The anger was the motivation. The other aspect was that his mother, when she saw that he was angry, she took him and made him take a shower. Then she dressed him with really nice clothing. And she put perfume on him and she made him look really well-groomed, presentable in the highest esteem. And he, she said to him, I'm going to take you to learn knowledge behind the Imams in Medina. He said, but mother, I want to become a singer. He had a nice voice. But his mother was very smart and wise and said to him, son, you know, singing is not just about the voice. Singing comes with good looks and you don't have it. You don't have good looks. You don't have it. You don't have what it takes. Even though Imam Malik was very good looking. So she took him to the Medina Masjid al-Nabawi. Over there he found, he saw 70 Imams giving 70 different classes at once. She chose for him a particular scholar. She chose an Imam by the name of Rabi'a ibn Abdul Rahman. Rabi'atul Ra'i, the garden of the best opinions. The first thing his mother said to him was this. She looked him in the eye and said to him, Son, I put you with this Imam not just so you can learn his knowledge. Before you learn his knowledge, I want you to learn his adab, his morals and his character. It was Eid time. And as students in Eid, they go and celebrate. Imam Malik, what's he doing? He's going to the house of Imam Al-Zuhri. And he went with his books and his pen and he waited outside the house of Imam Al-Zuhri. He was about 16 years old at that time. And he waited and waited and waited and there was a servant of Imam Al-Zuhri. She saw Imam Malik outside and she told Imam Al-Zuhri about him. And they used to call him the blonde boy. She said he was the blonde boy. And he said, let him in. So he came inside and Imam Al-Zuhri thought that you know, he's coming to eat the Eid food with him. So the Imam put in front of Malik and Imam Malik looked at it and said, I don't want food. He said, what do you mean you don't? Then why are you here? He said, teach me, tell me hadith. He said he sat down and he taught him 40 hadiths with their chain of narrations. And the Imam's writing it. Then the Imam says, teach me more. And he said to him, Imam Zuri, go first and learn these and then come back, I'll teach you more. He said, I've learned them. He said, really? He said, yes, he said, give me it. Gave it to him, he says, tell me. And he said them all with their chain of narrations without a single mistake at all, just by writing them once. When he did that, the Imam Zuri looked at him and he said, Qum, stand up, stand before me. Stand, for you are one of the vessels of knowledge. You are one of the exceptions which Allah made. Allah bears witness of greatness to Himself that there is no God worthy of worship but Him. And He bears witness to the greatness of His creation of the angels. And He bears witness to the importance and greatness of those endued with knowledge. Imam Malik ibn Anas. He was born in the year 93 Hijri in Medina, about the year 760. The man of aura. The man whom when you looked at him, you cannot help yourself but give him respect. Even though his origin was from Yemen and he lived in Medina, he, lo he really stood out. He was a tall man, wide-chested, broad-chested man, wide eyes, strong-looking man. And he was blonde hair, white face, 
and some narrations say had blue eyes. His beard was long until it reached its ch his chest. He wore the most elegant and eloquent clothing. When you looked at him, even if you didn't know that he was an Imam, his features strike you. And you find something inside of you forcing you to respect this man. His father was a Tabi'i. He had three brothers and one sister. One of his brothers, his older brother by the name of an nadir ibn Anas, he was the man of knowledge. They used to say, Malik, the brother of Imam al nadir When Imam Malik reached his position by the will of Allah, they started calling al nadir al nadir the brother of Imam Malik. Imam Malik was a Tabi'i Tabi'i. He met the people who met the Sahabas. The grandfather of, of Imam Malik, his name was Malik ibn Anas as well. And his great-grandfather was a Sahabi. His name was Abu Amir. His grandfather, Malik ibn Anas, was a friend of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. Imam Malik started his knowledge at the age of 10 years. And he spent his whole life in Medina, in the land of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He never left Medina al-Munawwara, only to Mecca when he went and did Hajj or Umrah. He never even rode on a camel or any transport vehicle in his entire life when he was living in Medina. Because in his righteousness and love for the Prophet wasallam, and as a role model, he saw it disrespectful as an Imam representing his deen in the highest esteem to lift himself off the ground out of respect for the Messenger وسلم, while his body was in the ground. When the Khulafa, the rulers, when he went to meet them, and the rulers were in Iraq, in Baghdad, and Kufa, in those areas, he never left to see them there. Whenever he wanted to give them advice, he waited when they came to Hajj, to Mecca. If he was there, he'd meet them in the residential palaces. And when they came to Medina, he would go to the residential palaces and meet them there, and advise them. He never went to a ruler for any need for himself, or for any need of that ruler. The only time he ever went to the rulers or officials was for only one reason was to advise them when they had erred and this is the trait of all the Imams and especially the four Imams my brothers and sisters in Islam Imam Malik learnt of his first teacher Rabi'at al-Ra'i for seven whole years dedicated to him after that he started with the famous Imam Abdullah ibn Hurmuz Abdullah ibn Hurmuz was an ex-servant slave he graduated after eight years from Ibn Hurmuz's school. There is another Imam that he learned of. His name was Imam Al-Zuhri. Jafar was the grandson of Ali. And he was a very important figure who was the teacher of Imam Malik. And there is a school of thought called the Jafari Madhab. I just want to mention one of Imam Jafar's very famous quote. He said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destined for us things and he made them unknown. And what he wanted from us he showed it to us. So why do you have to sit there and thinking of the future? Don't think of the unknown. Don't worry about the unknown and ask questions of the unknown. Think and worry about what you have that is known and work with it. When he went with these uh, scholars, he was a bit... He used to try and play a game to win the scholar all for himself. So he used to bring some dates and stuff and he would assign some of his mates, his friends in the class and he would say, I'll give you some date to persuade the, the students to go back home today. So they'd go back home and he'd be one with him or one or two people with this teacher and so he'd have this teacher all for himself. And that's where Imam Malik began. He was a vessel of knowledge. And he loved hadith, he loved his teachers. He used to stand outside and wait for his teachers in the, in the heat of the sun, right in the middle of the dhuha when everyone else was at home. And he'd wait for his Imam. One of his Imams, Imam Ibn Hurmuz, he never liked people to stop him and ask him questions except at the time of his dars. But Imam Malik didn't settle for that. He tried to always work his way around. So he'd wait on that rock and when the Imam came out, he'd see him. And he'd rush after him very secretly. And the first thing he would do is he would say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The Imam has to say, wa alaikum as -salam. And he would say, yeah, Imam, just about that, mas about that hadith, can you just uh, narrate that to me again? And about this, mas he tried to get as many as he can from that Imam. And the Imam would have to answer him, you know, as he was walking by. He excelled in, and mastered in his knowledge. But his sister became worried that, you know, he used to stand a lot of day, a lot of hours in the sun. Sometimes he'd come back really sunburnt. 
Her father said to her, don't worry daughter, he'll be alright. He is learning the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Let him endure. And he actually became at the uh, qualification of a mufti. One who can actually look at Quran and hadith by themselves raw and bring out new verdicts, new rulings for very new circumstances that haven't existed before. That's a mufti and a mushtay. It's not very easy to be like that. When he was 21 years old, he became that mufti. And he said, I did not give any fatwa until I had 70 great scholars who had qualified me. These were 70 of the greatest imams, fuqaha, jurisprudence, scholars of Medina, 70, who qualified him to be ready. They said, you are now ready to make, derive your own opinions, obviously based on dalil, from raw Qur'an and raw hadiths. That's something beyond measure. His way of thinking was a little bit different to Imam Abu Hanifa. In fact, very different to all the Imams. He didn't like to dwell into areas of controversial issues in Aqidah. And he didn't like to dwell into areas of ideological differences, such as what used to happen in Kufa with Imam Abu Hanifa, with the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij, philosophies of uh, Greek theology and Aristotle's beliefs, uh, such as saying today, modernist views, he didn't dwell into them. In fact, he didn't need to do that because he was living in Medina. Imam Malik was a traditional man. He taught according to the actions and practices of the people of Medina. He was to look at the companions who lived in Medina and his laws and school of thought revolves a lot around it. And one of his students by the name of Yahya ibn Yahya, he says, a man entered into our circle one day and he asked the Imam a question. He said, Ya Imam, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, the most merciful, rose above his throne. That's literally what it says in the Quran. He asked, how did Allah rise? Imam Malik put his head down and the students could see him sweating, sweating out of anger. He was angry at that question. So Imam Malik looked up and he said to him, I don't know how above, but Allah is above, he's not below. And asking this question is an innovation. And then he looked at him and he said to his students, get him out. They carried him out of the masjid quickly. And he said, I don't see you except an innovator or a mischievous person who wants to cause fitna. That's how we dealt with these issues. Imam Malik's fiqh, like every other scholar, including Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik first looked at the Qur'an for solutions. If there was no clear-cut solution in the Qur'an, then he would look second into the Sunnah, the ways of the Prophet If there was nothing clear-cut, and now we're coming down to very detailed, minute information now about the deen, it has to be something quite special that has occurred. He would look into the opinions of the Sahabas, then if he couldn't find a clear-cut solution from the opinions of the Sahaba, he would then look at something called Al-Ijma' Consensus of the companions and consensus of the scholars, the great scholars that existed. And up to here, all the four Imams still followed up to this stage. Now here was where Imam Malik differed. He looked at something which the other Imams didn't agree with him about. Including one of his very close colleagues who studied with him, his name was al ibn Sa'd, Imam Malik used to use the practices of the people of Medina, meaning he would look at their practices and how they acted, and he would say, act like them. And there were more than 120,000 companions in Medina that lived by the time Imam Malik came around. Layth ibn Sa'ad used to write letters to him saying, Ya Imam, you are right to use these great Sahabas of Medina, that's good, we don't see ourselves any better than them. However, not 200 years later, there are customs involved, traditions of your culture. And Imam Malik respected his opinion, but he stuck to his own, believing that this is the right one. If he couldn't find it among the people of Medina, he went to something which Imam Abu Hanifa used, and that is Qiyas, to come to a ruling by comparison. He'd look at a ruling that's similar to it, and say, okay, we'll say that it's like this, we'll practice it like this. The scholars used to say that smoking cigarettes is makru, it's just disliked. But when they found out the effects of smoking and tobacco and how bad it is, we conclude that cigarettes and tobacco is haram like the way drugs are or alcohol is haram. 
Imam Malik also looked at a very unique way, and this is where he really differed, something full of flexibility. In his madhab, you will find three things that the other Imams didn't. One of it was called Al-Istihsan, which means the better of two fiqh of matters. If he's got two fiqh of matters, he'll take the easier one, or the better one. And the second thing he used to follow was Sadd al which means something lawful or unlawful, depending on what it will lead to. For example, if it leads to destruction, eliminate it. And thirdly, al-masalih al-mursala, the benefits of the public. If something may lead to the harm of the public or, or community, even if it was something halal, then you should stop it. And this is to look at the benefits of the people at large. But Imam Malik's madhab was actually the most flexible because of these three. And the other Imams differed about that, they didn't really agree on it. Maybe Abu Hanifa to a certain extent. Imam Malik produced a monumental <coughs> book. It is called Al Muwatta. Al Muwatta lil Imam Malik. This book is a collection of prophetic hadiths and some companion sayings, etc. It contains currently about 1,720 hadiths. And it was about 100 years before Bukhari and Muslim and the six books of hadith that we know about. So basically, some scholars say this was probably the first book of hadith ever. And it is one of the most authentic. Now this uh, book, it took about 11 years of Imam Malik's time to complete. And it came to us through one of the students of Abu Hanifa, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani, who studied under Malik for three years. And he propagated this book along with another scholar. It reached another scholar by the name of Asad ibn al-Furat, who was famous for uh, propagating Islam to a place called Sicily. And a student of Malik wrote al muwatta and the basics of the madhabs spread to Africa and Spain. And this kitab uh, al muwatta was spread by his students. Imam Malik didn't write al muwatta himself. He collected it and his students actually put it together. The way they put it was, first of all, there was 100,000 hadiths in it. From the 100,000, 9,000 were taken as being most authentic. And from the 9,000, we finally ended up with 1,720 most authentic hadith till today. That among them are several of them which Imam Malik narrated himself. We call it the golden chain. They are the most authentic hadiths existing today. Any hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that had the following chain from Malik, who heard it from Nafi'ah, who heard it from Ibn Umar, who heard it from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If you see that chain before any hadith, the scholars unanimously say this is the strongest chain of narration to exist in any form of hadith. They call it the golden chain. Imam Shafi'i says about al muwatta No book before the book of Allah was more authentic and accurate than al muwatta Keeping in mind that Bukhari and Muslim weren't existing at that time. Imam al-Mansur, who was the Khalifa at that time, remember we mentioned him in the time of Abu Hanifa, he came up to Imam Malik at the Kaaba and he said to him, Ya Imam, I want this book to be copied and printed and distributed and I want it to be the main source and every other book of hadith to be destroyed and burnt. Imam Malik said to him, No, don't do that. For there are people who receive knowledge from their Imams and from different sources. And there could be sources that are not known to me. To take only my book and refuse all the rest is a dangerous thing to do. Don't take away all the other knowledge just based on mine. For I am a man of knowledge and there is still more for me to learn. And this is the way the Imams always spoke. Imam Malik's greatest fear. Someone asked them a question and they've got to give them a verdict. Every time Imam Malik was asked for a verdict that didn't exist before, he would say to the person, wait. He'd go and make wudu, then he'd come back, he'd sit down, and he would start by saying, there is no might, and there is no power except with Allah. Then, he would give the answer to the best of his knowledge. He used to say, there is nothing more harder upon me in life than when I was asked a question about halal or haram, is this permissible or not? Because I am representing the ruling of Allah Himself, the Creator of the world. So the scholar's form of decoration was a common motto. I do not know. Al-Haythami, which was one of the students of Imam Malik, says, 
I witnessed Imam Malik being asked about 48 issues, matters, on separate occasions. He replied to 32 out of 48 of them, he replied to them, I do not know. There is a story about a Moroccan. He had a question which all of the Imams of Morocco could not answer him. So he traveled for four months with a message from the Imam saying, there is no knowledgeable scholar on the face of the earth than Imam Malik. Go to him in Medina and get us the answer for your question. So he set out for four months. You can imagine the desert and the heat and the struggle. When he arrived, he asked Imam Malik the question. Imam Malik met and made wudu, came and sat down, said, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, stood up and said to him, Give me till tomorrow. The next day he did the same thing and he sat down and he said to him, My answer is, I do not know. The Moroccan student stood up and said, Ya Imam, with all due respect, the Imams of Morocco are waiting for my answer and I've traveled four months and now I have to return another four months. So, how many is that? eight months to get the answer I can't say to them the great Imam says I do not know well then go and tell your scholars that Imam Malik says he doesn't know the Moroccan went back and this is what he told them I do not know because this can earn him this place in hellfire if he knew that he had made a mistake he'd gather his students and then he would clarify his mistake in front of all his students that's something very heavy to do. Listen students, I said this before and I've made a mistake. This is what the correct answer is. In his circles, if anybody spoke while he is speaking, that would be forbidden. In his circles, he never allowed someone, he didn't like people asking him, what's your dalil? They're asking him things which they don't understand themselves. Opposite to Abu Hanifa's circles, he used to encourage his students to discuss and debate. As for Imam Malik who lived in Medina, the knowledge in Medina was different. It was quite strict and straightforward. And these ideologies of Khawarij and uh, Mu'tazila and Greek philosophy and uh, Aristotle's beliefs and stuff, they weren't in Medina. So Imam Malik was not interested in all those ideologies. Anyone who asked them, does Allah have a hand? Where is he? In which face is he directed? And all those thoughts, he never attempted to even answer them except in one way. Brief answers that made them be quiet, take it as it is and walk away. Where he used to sit was the same spot where the Prophet ﷺ used to sit and teach. It was the same spot where Umar عنه, the Khalifa sat and taught. He never in his life narrated a single hadith while standing. Imam Malik, before he ever said one hadith, he'd go and have a shower or he'd make wudu. Then he'd pray two rak'ahs. Then he'd wear the best of clothing put on the best of perfume, enter the masjid quietly and would not say a word until serenity and peace befell him. Wallahi, I'm not exaggerating. This is what his students say. He went to the seat of the, where the Prophet used to sit and he sat there. Then he looked up at his students and he spoke the hadith with its narration. That's how Imam Malik narrated hadith. Imam Malik, he went against the norms, yes of the scholars, which is to accept the gifts from the scholars. I'd like to say that all four Imams, even though they had different ways of dealing with the government, all of them got imprisoned and all of them got tortured, including Imam Malik, even with the way Imam Malik dealt with them. Imam Malik witnessed the fall of the Umayyad dynasty and the rise of the Abbasid dynasty. He witnessed eight Khalifas in the time of the Umayyad dynasty and five Khalifas in the time of the Abbasid dynasty. He lived 90 years or 86 or 90 years, making him the longest living of among the four Imams. The point is that Imam Malik was courageous and this is proof that him taking the gifts did not mean that he was a government puppet like some of the scholars today. He was not a government scholar. Once Harun al-Rashid, he gave 3,000 dirhams to Imam Malik. And he said to him, when these 3,000 dirhams reach you, I want you to come immediately to my palace with my royal order. He had to leave Medina and go 
to, to Iraq, to Baghdad. Imam Malik never left Medina and he insisted on never ever leaving it. A letter to come to me to Baghdad because of the 3,000 dinars. He sent the 3,000 dinars back saying to him, I will never leave Medina. In other words, keep dreaming. So what did Harun al-Rashid do? To show you how much they respected him, he sent him double, 6,000 dirhams with no conditions. So Imam Malik looked at the wealth and looked at his students and says, the Prophet Prophet says, whoever leaves something for the sake of Allah, Allah will give him something better. And he distributed among his students and himself. Just showing you that if he was a government scholar, would he say something like that? Never. Now, because of this truth, something happened and he had to face a terrible ordeal. He clashed with the state. Every Imam clashed with the state. A revolution against Abu Ja'far al-Mansur began and Imam Abu Hanifa was about in his 60s at that time. And the people who started this uh, revolution were people from the Prophet's family. And the leader of the revolutionists was led by Muhammad and nafs al zakiyya who was a descendant of Imam Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu. And Imam Malik, he supported the leader of this movement. If Muhammad, Imam Muhammad and nafs al zakiyya great Imam, if he became the new ruler, then it would be better. This is what Imam Malik thought on the inside. What happened was, the governor of Medina, so he started going around basically forcing the people to pledge allegiance for him. And the people didn't like this, so the revolution <coughs> increased. One day someone asked the Imam Malik a question, which had a political motive behind it. And Imam Malik knew, knew this, is very smart. The question was, if a man was forced to divorce his wife, and he divorced her, does the divorce count? Imam Malik said, in fiqh and Islam, nothing is valid out of force. So the Khalifa found out and he sent news for the Imam to stop saying what he was saying and never to repeat that rule, that verdict again. The Imam replied, I cannot conceal knowledge if I know it. So they sent a spy to one of his circles and this spy asked the question again to check if this Imam really meant what he's saying, to test him. So we asked him the question, the Imam answered him exactly the same answer as before, knowing the political consequence of it. The result of this was, there was an order to capture Imam Malik in Medina, to the governor, the prince of Medina. They captured him, imprisoned him, and they tortured him. He was beaten so badly until his arms became disabled and his shoulder, his right shoulder, was dislocated. In that time, Imam Malik prayed a little while with his arms down. This is documented. Then there was a second revolt. When they heard about Imam Malik being tortured this way, his students got up. You mess with his students? So Imam al-Mansur, Khalifa al-Mansur, he came in person to Medina and he says, I apologize, Ya Imam, I did not order this. Please tell me what you need and I will give you. And I've sacked the governor and I've humiliated him and so on. This is what he claimed. And Imam Malik therefore was not a government scholar. The end of his life of Imam Malik after that, he became very ill at the age of 90. And he could not go to the masjid for a little while. He died at the age of 90 years. A young man the age of about 13 years old, in the time of Imam Malik, when Imam Malik was in his middle ages, a young boy by the age of 13, his mother from Mecca, his mother said to him, my son you are now well known, you have memorized the whole Quran and you have memorized Hadith and you have memorized poetry. I want to send you to Imam Malik to learn his adab, his character, before you learn his knowledge. So she got him ready and she wrote a letter to the Prince of Mecca, the governor of Mecca, who happened to be her cousin. She wrote a letter to him to send a letter to the governor of Medina to go with her son to Imam Malik, basically to intercede for him, to become his teacher. So this young boy took this letter from his mother 
and sent him off, young 13-year-old going through the deserts to Medina, seeking knowledge. He reached the governor of Medina and gave him the letter of the governor of Mecca. And the governor of Medina, his face changed. He started to sweat. The young boy looked at him and said, what's wrong? He said, Wallahi, if the governor of Mecca asked me to walk barefooted in the middle of the desert with nothing on my head, it would be easier than for me to go to Imam Malik's house. Because he had so much respect for him. So the boy innocently said to him, well, you don't have to go to him, make him come to you. The governor of Medina laughed and he said, come on, let's go. So he went to Imam Malik's house. They knocked on the door and the housemaid, the servant of Imam Malik, answered. And they asked for Imam Malik. She said to him, listen, if there is a religious question, right now is not the time. Write it on a paper and he will answer it for you. If you want to learn hadith, go to his circles of daras, they'll be in a certain time. And if it's a government issue, this is not the time, there's another time for it. So the governor of Medina says, I have a letter for him from the prince of Makkah. So then the young boy says, a big, tall man, blonde, white, colored eyes, unexpected from the people of Medina, came to the door. So as I looked up at him, and the servant lady brought him a chair, he sat on it. And then he said, what does the governor of Mecca want from me? And the governor of Medina just gave him the paper without a word. When Imam Malik read this paper, he threw the paper away saying, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Has it come to this that knowledge now needs connections? He looked at the young boy and the young boy said to him, May Allah straighten the path of the shaykh. He said to him, I am from the lineage of the Prophet So now, basically, he forced, he obliged the Imam to listen to him. Ana Qurashi. I have memorized the Quran at the age of seven. And your muwatta, the whole of it, I've memorized it with this chain of narrations by the age of ten. My mother sent me here to learn from you. Imam Malik looked at him and said, O oh young boy, fear Allah and stay away from sins. If you do so, there will be something of your future if you apply these two advices. Does anyone know who the young boy was? He was Imam Muhammad ibn Idris al-Shafi'i.